Hi, I'm Eric Voss, and Game of Thrones Season 7 is coming, and it looks like we're gonna get some huge payoff in these final episodes. But it's easy to forget that there are actually a lot of unresolved questions and mysteries that Game of Thrones still needs to explain. Some are interesting implications of recent bombshells, and others are lingering loose ends or bizarre moments from the past that no one ever really followed up on. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about the biggest questions and ways that the show might answer them. And spoiler warning, just in case any of my predictions or theories end up coming true. Okay, let's start with Jon Snow. We now know that he is half Targaryen, the son of Ned Stark's sister Lyanna, and the prince Rhaegar Targaryen. So the question is, what exactly does that Targaryen lineage mean for him now? So if Lyanna and Rhaegar were married, that would make Jon, in a way, heir to the Iron Throne. At least using the argument that Daenerys is using, that Robert Baratheon was an illegitimate usurper, and that the throne still legally belongs to the Targaryen dynasty. And if Jon is a non-bastard son, of the crown prince of that dynasty, his claim to the throne is even slightly stronger than Daenerys's. So if this truth becomes public knowledge, will that hurt Daenerys's campaign to reclaim the throne? And will that make her and Jon enemies? Not to say that Jon wants the Iron Throne, but will Daenerys see him as a threat? Or looking at things more optimistically, since they're family now, will their bloodlines bring them closer together? And in the eyes of the reigning monarch, Cersei, will this now be a second Targaryen orphan that she has to face on the battlefield. Meanwhile, from another perspective, if Jon's Targaryen background becomes public in the north, will that make him an enemy to his fellow northerners? Remember, all of these northern lords and their families followed the Starks into a war against the Targaryens. I could see this creating some tension. Remember, little Lady Lyanna Mormont and the rest swore fealty to Jon on the basis that Ned Stark's blood runs through his veins. And yeah, even though he still has Stark blood from his mother Lyanna, maybe these northerners will be sticklers about it. The king of the no! Wait, 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 you go... Leanna stalks blood and dragon blood? We have no king. Really, I'm just curious to know what Jon's real name is. It was hard to read Lyanna's lips in that season finale scene. It looked like it began with an A sound, so I'm guessing maybe some Targaryen A name, like Aegon or Aemon or Eris. We've also speculated that could it be Jaehaerys, which would connect Jon to an interesting parallel figure in the Targaryen family history. Actually, check out our season finale breakdown for more information on that. But let me know in the comments, do you think Jon's Targaryen blood will get him in trouble? And let's move on to Bran. So, what the hell can Bran do exactly? So, last season revealed that Bran now has the powers of the Three-Eyed Raven. He can connect with weirwood trees to glimpse into moments in the past, like the Kingslayer moment, or in the future, like Wildfire destroying the Sept. But the mystery here lies in whether or not Bran is able to change those events. So remember in the heartbreaking Hold the Door episode, Bran warged into Hodor's mind as a boy, making him hold the door in the present day so they could escape. And this choice by Bran proved to be the origin of Hodor constantly mumbling the nonsense word of Hodor throughout his life. And then in another time jump, when Bran looked at the Tower of Joy, he called out to his father and Ned turned around as if he heard him. So does this mean that Bran has the power to change the past? Or sounding like a real time travel nerd for a second, has Bran already changed some things in the past? Like maybe at some point in the future, he will go back to cause things that have already happened. I talked previously about the theories of Bran turning Turning the Mad King mad, for example, whispering the phrase, burn them all to him. Also the idea that Bran Stark could be the ancient Bran the Builder who built the wall thousands of years ago. Another theory is that the man whom we saw transform into the first White Walker could be Bran as an adult, meaning Bran could be the Night King. I don't know about that, but we'll talk more about the Night King later. Really, I could talk about the batshit implications of time travel for hours, but let's not forget that Bran is also a warg. He can control the mind of animals, even magical ones like direwolves. And yes, this could mean that we will see Bran warg into a dragon. Remember, at the end of season four, the Three-Eyed Raven made this cryptic promise. You'll never walk again. But you will fly. Now this could refer to Bran just flying through a different winged animal, or like flying through time in his visions, or just him taking on the title of the Three-Eyed Raven. But yeah, Dragon Bran is way cooler. I'm Team Bran Gun. Anyway, let me know in the comments all the crazy ways that you want to see Bran use his powers. Let's move on to another mystery, probably the biggest mystery on the show now. Who is Azor Ahai Reborn, aka the Prince That Was Promised? So the prophecy of Azor Ahai Reborn, also referred to as the Prince That Was Promised, refers to a character destined to vanquish the White Walkers. This person 
person is supposed to be born beneath a bleeding star amidst salt and smoke. They also carry a flaming sword called Lightbringer that was forged in a unique way. And some interpreters say that the figure is probably going to be born from the Targaryen bloodline and associated with dragons. So obviously the person who best fits his profile is Daenerys. But if you care less about the dragon aspect of it and more about the sword part of it, Jon Snow could also be a prime candidate. And then of course I made another video recently where I explained that Reddit theory that Jamie Lannister could be Azor Ahai. I've actually had a series of videos in the works that makes cases for other characters. But of course this could just be the case where we never find out. George R. R. Martin has said that he made Game of Thrones as a response to classic good versus evil chosen one stories that glorify war. So this whole prophecy might just be more interesting as a way to explore character. Like Stannis Baratheon was way more compelling as a man who firmly believed that he was a prophecy figure but then ultimately wasn't. And actually the same goes for Cersei Lannister who's obsessed with her own prophecy. So will Cersei's prophecy be fulfilled? So in the show Cersei was told as a girl that she will have three children with golden hair and golden shrouds meaning they'll die prematurely and as of the season six finale check Cersei was also told that she would be queen, but that she would be overthrown by a younger, more beautiful queen. And at different points, Cersei was paranoid that that could be Sansa, and then later, more likely, Marjorie Tyrell. And then, as of the season six finale, eh, nah. But obviously there is another younger, more beautiful queen on the way who poses a much bigger threat to Cersei's power, Yara Greyjoy. I mean, come on, she should be a queen. Euron Greyjoy is hashtag not my rule of the Iron Islands. No, but seriously, Cersei, look out because Daenerys Targaryen is on her way to destroy you. But I can honestly see either of those two powerful women, Daenerys or Yara, fulfilling Cersei's prophecy. I also wouldn't count out either of the Stark girls, Sansa or Arya. Like remember, Cersei is still at the top of Arya's wish list, and Arya has proven with Walder Frey that she can infiltrate castles and assassinate high lords and bake their sons into pies. Now, in the books, the prophecy also includes a bit about Cersei dying at the hands of the Voloncar, younger brother, suggesting that Jaime or Tyrion might end up killing her. Now, I've gone over this a lot. Actually, go check out our Jamie Lannister theory video for more thoughts on that or just Jamie in general. And let me know who you think Azor Ahai Reborn will be and your thoughts on Cersei's prophecy and whether Game of Thrones needs to fulfill these down in the comments. But let's move on to the other Lannister sibling, Tyrion. So how was Tyrion able to face Daenerys' dragons without getting burned alive? Like notice how the dragons Rhaegal and Viserion seemed shockingly tame around Tyrion. And we've speculated in the past that the reason could be that Tyrion has Targaryen blood too. That's right, everyone's a Targaryen. So the interesting theory is that while Tywin Lannister was hand the Mad King, the Mad King could have conceived a child with Tywin's wife, Joanna Lannister, who later died giving birth to Tyrion. And that might further explain why Tywin always treated Tyrion as less than a son. It could also explain why Tyrion had such natural bonds with Jon and Daenerys, whom he would be related to if this theory is true. Some more possible evidence for this is in the books, in Daenerys' vision in the House of the Undying. And she heard the phrase, the dragon has three heads, which you could interpret to mean that there will be three Targaryens, Daenerys, Jon, and someone else, maybe Tyrion. All riding the three dragons, like their ancestor, Aegon the Conqueror, and his sisters did during the conquest. And if you look closely at that final shot in the season seven trailer, there does look like there's a barely noticeable figure on Drogon's back. And some people said that could be Tyrion, but then again, I don't know how you would distinguish what that bump is. But also earlier in the trailer, there's a shot of Tyrion looking up as the three dragons fly past him. I don't know, this could be foreshadowing something. But comment down below and let me know what you think about this theory. Really, I'm just curious to see where Tyrion ends up. I want him to be on the Iron Throne. And I want him to find that first wife of his, Taisha, who's still out there somewhere. And mostly, I just want him to finally get to the punchline of that joke. I once brought a jackass and a honeycomb into a brothel. Silence! I once walked into a brothel with a honeycomb and a jackass. The madam says... But moving on, another character whose fate I'm curious about is Arya. Specifically, will Arya ever go west of Westeros? Remember last season, there was this almost forgettable moment where Arya briefly mentions to the actress Lady Crane that she might someday like to explore the west of Westeros. Essos is east and Westeros is west. But what's west of Westeros? I don't know. Nobody does. 
And this is pretty interesting, because the continent of Westeros has been compared in the past to the countries of Europe, like England and Scotland, Spain and Italy. And just like the people of that old world used to wonder about what was on the other side of the sea, the Americas, what if there's a whole other world off to the west of Westeros? Will Arya lead that global expedition? And since George R. R. Martin has said that the world of Game of Thrones is round, will Arya be the one to discover that the northern land of always winter actually connects to the far eastern part of Essos. I don't know, I just love maps. I want to see them filled out. Okay, moving on to someone who might join Arya on this road trip of sorts. Her direwolf, Nymeria. What happened to Nymeria? So Nymeria disappeared from the show back in season one, and over the seasons, all the other Stark direwolves have dired off. Lady, Grey Wind, Shaggy Dog, and Summer. Now it's just Jon's direwolf, Ghost, and Nymeria, wherever she is. Now, in the books, the direwolves have had way more symbolic significance to the Stark family. They're smarter and way larger, and they have more personality, and they possess a weirdly magical force. It's actually kind of implied that all the Stark children share a telepathic connection with the animals. So not just Bran, who's definitely a warg, but Rob and Grey Wind were described as one and the same on the battlefield. And in the books, Arya dreams through Nymeria's eyes as the direwolf leads a pack of wolves in the Riverlands. Now on the show, the direwolves are kind of played down. They're depicted more as loyal pets who make us really sad whenever they die. So will Arya ever see Nymeria again? Will reuniting with the direwolf be part of an emotional homecoming sequence like a reverse Homeward Bound? Or will this reunion be more badass, like Arya in the middle of battle with White Walkers alongside Dragon Bran, discovering her own warg abilities when her long lost direwolf appears? I think I just turned Game of Thrones into Pokemon. Okay, moving on. The other long lost Arya companion is Gendry. So where the hell has Gendry been? And are his arms super jacked from rowing back and forth across the narrow sea for three seasons? So Gendry, the blacksmith apprentice, who is also secretly the bastard son of Robert Baratheon, he was last seen departing Dragonstone at the end of season three. And actually, according to rumors, actor Joe Dempsey has been spotted in Belfast where Game of Thrones is shot. And if you look closely at this shot in the season seven trailer, I pointed out how this character is holding a Warhammer. Now the Warhammer is the famous weapon of choice by Robert Baratheon, Gendry's father. So I know just pointing to a weapon and saying it's a character is kind of a stretch, but maybe this is Gendry here, joining Jon Snow and the others against the White Walkers. Anyway, let me know in the comments if you think I'm crazy. Okay, moving on to two of the most mysterious figures of Game of Thrones who are impressively still alive. First, Littlefinger. Specifically, how much does Littlefinger know? Now I pointed out in the past that Littlefinger might know the truth about Jon's parentage, which could be why we see Jon shoving Littlefinger against the wall in the Winterfell crypts in the trailer. But the bigger mystery here is how would Littlefinger Littlefinger know that. I mean, sure, he does have informants all over Westeros, but if Littlefinger knew that Ned Stark's bastard was really the royal son of Prince Rhaegar Targaryen, Littlefinger would also probably know that the whole basis of Robert's rebellion, Lyanna being kidnapped, was actually a lie. And this is where I get paranoid, because we know that it was Littlefinger who manipulated Liza Arryn into poisoning her husband and then blaming the Lannisters for the sole purpose of creating a conflict between the Lannisters and the Starks so that Littlefinger could capitalize on that chaos. Chaos is a ladder. So what if it was Littlefinger behind the earlier war as well, Robert's Rebellion? Like notice how it did end up with him climbing the ladder to become the master of coin. So do you think Littlefinger could be behind all of this? Comment and weigh in, let me know. Now the other mysterious figure that I mentioned is Varys. And the biggest question I have about this guy is, what the hell is going on with that wizard in a box? Okay, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. In season two, Varys told Tyrion about the sorcerer who tortured him as a boy and how he later tracked down the old man and kept him alive in a Great. So we know that Varys in general looks down on torture and claims to do everything for the good of the realm, specifically the orphan children like he was. So how does torturing an old wizard in a wooden crate fit in with all that? When's he gonna let Dumbledore out of the box? Okay, old man, I'll let you out, but no funny business. Oh, drats, he transformed himself into a chicken. Why did I do this?
So another mystery that I'm curious about involves the religions of Westeros. Which of these many gods is the true god? Now we've seen several different faiths on this show, and more than one of them have shown their own kind of divine power. There are the old gods who are still worshipped in the north. They've been kind of legitimized now that their weirwood trees, the three-eyed raven, and the children of the forest all have shown to have legit magic. Uh, meanwhile, the followers of the Lord of Light, the monotheistic religion from Essos, have successfully resurrected more than one person from the dead. So I would also say that's a miracle. Then there's the drowned god of the Iron Islands, who also has had some kind of resurrection power. Remember, every time they baptize someone, they're technically drowning them first. Then there's the many-faced god of the faceless men, who seemed mystic and divine at first, but now we know that that magic is based more on sleight of hand and super fast wardrobe changes. Now, the most traditional and widespread of these religions in Westeros is the new gods, the Seven, but they, along with the Dothraki worship of the Great Stallion, kind of went up in smoke, literally. And then there's this obscure deity that Varys brought up one time. In the Summer Isles, they worship the fertility goddess with 16 teats. Oh, sounds legit to me. So I'm curious to see how the two currently most powerful religions on the show, the Lord of Light and the Old Gods, are reconciled. Specifically, there's so much we don't know about characters like Kinvara, the high priestess of the Lord of Light. There's also that mysterious Riddler character from the same city that Kinvara's from, Ashai. Remember, her name was Quaith, the Shadowbinder. Does she have any connection to the Lord of Light? Is she ever coming back? You can tell us how she made that awesome mask? We'd actually love to make another video that dives deep into all these different religions on the show, but in the meantime, let me know what you think in the comments. And moving on to the final big unresolved mystery of Game of Thrones. What exactly do the White Walkers want? So last season, we finally got some big information about the White Walkers or the others as they're known in the books. They were created by the Children of the Forest as a white weapon of mass destruction during the War with Men. So we now know how they were created, but what do they hope to achieve? Or do they just have no goals other than to kill everything in sight, like evil ice terminators? Sure, it does seem like Game of Thrones is heading towards an epic battle of good versus evil, with the men finally joining forces to face off against these supernatural weapons of war. But now that I say that, I feel like the George R. R. Martin version of that war would end with like the White Walkers just winning, and the Night King sitting on the Iron Throne and getting his balls stuck to it. So thinking outside of the box, and all the other alternate ways this could go. The theory that makes the most sense to me is that the Night King's goal is to do what every artificial instrument of destruction inevitably does, meet his maker and destroy him. So how would the Night King destroy the children of the forest? Like, aren't they all already dead? Well, maybe not. According to legend, in the middle of the God's Eye Lake is the Isle of Faces. Now, this is a sacred historical site where the children of the forest and men agreed to the pact that ended their war. The island is supposed to be covered in weirwood trees and no one goes there other than a group of caretakers called the Green Men. And I think that some remaining children of the forest might be there too. And this could be where the Night King and his White Walker army are headed to finish off the children of the forest. In fact, that might be why the White Walkers keep making this spiral pattern in the snow, which remember reflects the pattern of these stones surrounding the weirwood tree where the Night King was created. It could be a warning from the Night King that he remembers the day that the children of the forest doomed him to this life of endless torment. And now that I'm looking at these shots, I'm wondering if this weirwood tree where the Night King was created might be on the Isle of Faces. And maybe Bran's second vision of it, where it was all frozen over, is a look into the future, when winter has covered all of Westeros and ice, which could happen in season seven and eight, and maybe the White Walkers have returned to their original home smack in the middle of Westeros. Okay, okay, fair enough, I may have pushed you too far with that theory. There's just so much mystery with the White Walkers, and my mind is going to weird places. But what do you think the White Walkers end goal is? And what other unresolved questions do you want to see answered in these final two seasons? And also remember to weigh in on those other questions about Jon, Bran, Azor Ahai, Cersei, Tyrion, Arya, and all the rest. And get your friends to weigh in on this stuff too. You can like this video and share it around, and you can tweet any thoughts or questions to me directly at EA Voss or at New Rockstars at New Rockstars. This channel is actually going to start doing some giveaways on Twitter, so make sure to follow us. And of course, subscribe to New Rockstars. We got some really great Game of Thrones content in the works. You're gonna love it. And you can actually have a say in what videos we make here by contributing to us on Patreon. Thank you so much to all of our current patrons, especially Wilhelmina Ebison. Okay, thanks for watching. Damn it. Varys' box wizard got out again. Oh, it's getting in the food. Varys, this is on you.